while the world he inhabits is in some respects counterfeit, there's nothing fake about Truman himself. Hello, and welcome back to my channel, Make Better Media, where we discuss and analyze movies and TV shows to see where the writing went gloriously well or horribly wrong. Today I want to take a quick look at The Truman Show, a movie about a man whose entire life has been televised without his knowledge, his entire world being a reality fabricated by a single writer and populated by actors, a movie that expertly plays with your emotions and makes you question your sense of reality. The premise of the movie is fairly unique. The questions it poses are certainly similar to The Matrix but I'm sure most would agree this movie is almost entirely different. It's an interesting question though, that I'm sure most people have thought about at some point in their lives. What if the reality I see isn't the true reality? This is the main question The Truman Show poses, but is it well done? Is the movie well made? Well, if you don't already agree that it is, then hopefully this video will show not only that it is well made, but more importantly, why it's well made. So without further ado, let us begin. Well, for me, there is no there is no difference between a private life and a public life. My my life is my life. Is the Truman Show? The Truman Show is a lifestyle. It's a noble life. It is a truly blessed life. The film starts with an excellent opening, showing us the credits for the show within the movie, and we get these interesting little interviews with the actors that are playing the characters in Truman's life. They talk about how being on the Truman Show isn't just an acting job, but that it's a lifestyle, and Marlon, the man who plays Truman's best friend, says that nothing on the show is fake, it's merely controlled. This gives us an excellent look right at the start about what this movie is going to be about. Is there a difference between the true reality and a manufactured reality if we're unable to tell the difference? Are you real? Well, if you can't tell, does it matter? This is an excellent way of setting up the premise of the movie. It shows us that the people on the show truly believe they're doing a noble thing. They believe all they're doing is making a show that gives hope and life to people who need it. They don't see what they've been doing as an awful thing to do to another person. They just want to put on the best show possible. After the interviews, it cuts to Truman talking to himself in front of the mirror, and right off the bat we get excellent characterization for Truman. He's a dreamer, someone who wants to be an adventurer, but as we know, he's been trapped. As he's initially leaving for work, we get his catchphrase. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> And then a light falls from the sky. I was initially confused by this. I thought this was something that should certainly tip him off to something being not right. But then I realized that if this were to happen to me, the fact that I was on a TV show that was constantly broadcasting my life would be so far from my mind. But now we see Truman on his morning commute to work, and a theory I have that I really hope is true is when he's driving his car, the radio always plays classical music. This could be because the music would be public domain and royalty free to play on live TV. But after Truman gets to work, we get the prelude to his tragic love story with Lauren. It's something we don't really understand when first watching, but it does serve to set up his desire to go to Fiji. Now one of his co-workers gives him a file, telling him that he has to go across the bay in order to close a deal. And this is where we also get Truman's intense fear of the ocean. But this is something I don't really understand. All of this is scripted, obviously, so why would they want to put him in a situation where he could potentially overcome his fear of the ocean? Maybe they just want some more drama for the TV show, or maybe they want to test him to see if he has overcome that fear, so they know if they need to concoct more ways to keep him on the island. I don't know. It's not really a huge deal, and there are potential answers to this. I guess it's just something I wish we could have seen. However, the efficiency with which this movie characterizes Truman is honestly incredible, because right after that we get Truman talking to his best friend, telling him how he wants to leave, he wants to get off the island and go to Fiji. But right after this we get flashbacks of Truman when he lost his father in a boating accident, something that would obviously be tragic, but to find out that not only was it not real, but to know that it was manufactured, that's something that no human has ever really had to deal with. That's really the beauty of this movie. This premise is something that no one has ever actually gone on through but we can almost all relate to on a fundamental level because it's something you can't actually prove isn't happening to you right now. It's an existential fear that pretty much anyone can feel but we really don't understand the ramifications it would have if that fear turned out to be true. But after his time at the beach he walks past his father on the street. He sees him and tries to talk to him but before he can really say anything people take him away onto a bus. 
This gets explained as the law enforcement trying to clean up the city of homeless people, but you can see that it certainly sparks something in Truman. It sparks a search for truth. This is when he begins to question the things around him, so he goes and talks to his mother about what happened, and she tells him that she sees his father all the time, implying that it was just a hallucination. I just can't get over the absolute lack of morality these characters have. To put someone through the loss of their father when you know it's a lie. To pretend to be someone's mother, the person you're supposed to trust more than anyone else and just lie to them for their entire life. It's heartbreaking to watch. But this movie crafts these scenarios so well, it puts them in an almost fun light. It makes it so you don't truly feel just how tragic all of this is. Now we get another flashback, this time it's Truman seeing Lauren, and the scene gives us one of those love at first sight looks. After that we get a scene of a dance party where he's dancing with Meryl, but he sees Lauren through the crowd, and it's obvious that he wants to talk to her. But after a few seconds we see Lauren being taken away by people in suits. This is showing us that even Truman's relationship with his now wife is something that was manufactured, forced down a path that Truman didn't want to take. Then it cuts to Truman being in a college library where he runs into Lauren again, and the fact that she's here and so close to Truman definitely makes it seem like she snuck onto the set. She's also wearing a pin that says, how's it going to end? This shows us that she truly cares for Truman, and she wants him to know the truth. This is the only person ever in Truman's life that has genuinely cared for him, and she's ripped away because of that fact. Because she cares, and because she's real, she has no place in Truman's life. Now we see the picture that Truman is creating, trying to recreate Lauren, directly behind a picture of his wife. We cut to Truman in his car, and his radio begins to malfunction, and he hears people talking about his every move. This is where Truman truly begins to realize that something is not right. He starts feeling paranoid. He begins acting erratically, like he's trying to find cracks in the world around him. He finds an elevator with nothing behind the door, just people who look like they're on a set. But even now, he doesn't realize that his life is fake, because, I mean, why would he? I don't think even if all this happened to anyone, except the most paranoid of us, that we would fully realize that our entire life was fake. Every relationship we've ever had has been scripted, and every path we've taken was laid before us by a screenwriter. Now we get the sequence where Truman is trying to get into the hospital to see his wife, and we get the hilarious bit of all the ways the showrunners try to organically block his path. Sorry. It's okay. Here, let me help you with that. After that, though, he goes to a travel agency to get a ticket to Fiji, and I love all the little hints they have around Truman trying to discourage him from traveling. There's the poster warning about disease and terrorism, and the poster of the plane getting struck by lightning. It's all just wonderful little details. Now we see where Truman realizes the people around him are pretty much stuck on a loop, and this is where we start to see the beginning of his near psychological breakdown. He traps Meryl in the car with him and begins driving at high speeds, and we clearly see that he's trying to throw off whatever is causing things to block his way. He seems to throw off the showrunners and makes it all the way to the bridge, where we see his fear of the ocean kick in as he's unable to cross the bridge. But to overcome this, he grabs Meryl's hand and throws it onto the wheel, closes his eyes and stomps on the gas pedal. This is the kind of consistent character writing I love to see. Even though he's in the midst of a psychological break, he still holds on to this fear of the ocean. The writers could have just as easily made Truman forget about this fear, given the situation, but they remembered it. They got creative and they wrote around it. it may seem small, but these are the kinds of things that are unappreciated nowadays. The parts of stories that make these characters so believable and relatable. This is what defines the art form to me. Truman gets taken back home after failing to leave the island, and he begins to get suspicious of Meryl. This is also where we get the part of the movie that always makes me laugh the hardest. Why don't you let me fix you some of this new Mococo drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? Who are you talking to? I've tasted other Cocos. This is the best. What the hell? After that, though, Meryl pulls a knife on him, and he grabs her and she yells, Do something! This clearly tips him off to the fact that she's talking to someone other than him. And I just have to say, the casting of Jim Carrey for this movie could not have been more perfect. He straddles the line between being a tragic character and an almost cartoonish character with flawless precision. I really couldn't imagine how this movie would have turned out had the role gone to anyone else. 
But now we see one of the hardest parts of the movie for me to watch. Truman is sitting on the end of the pier, talking to his best friend. The person he should always be able to talk to, always be able to trust. He talks to Truman about the times they had growing up together. Then it cuts to the showrunners feeding him the lines. And he tells Truman that he would walk into traffic for him, and that the last thing he would ever do is lie to him. It's so hard to watch because I've had friendships like this, people that I could trust with my life. And if I were to find out that they had been fed lines through the entire relationship, relationship, that everything they had ever said to me had been a lie, it would be soul crushing. Now we get an interview with the show's creator and they take calls, and one of those calls is from Lauren. She calls Kristoff a liar and a manipulator, but Kristoff uses this as an excuse to justify what he's done. He tells her that he's given Truman the ability to lead a normal life, and if Truman was absolutely determined to leave, then he could. But Truman prefers his cell. And this is the line where I really believe the soul of the movie comes from. It's a true triumph of the human spirit, where even with a godlike figure that can actually control pretty much all the factors of Truman's life, he is still able to overcome all the obstacles laid before him, and still find the truth that he's seeking. It's really beautiful. After the interview, we see Truman go back to his normal life. We see him go through the routine he went through at the start of the movie, but at the end of the day, we see him fall asleep in the basement, and Truman goes missing. He's escaped, and the whole town starts to look for him. But this is where I feel like I need to give the movie some criticism. Even if they are able to find him, if they find him like this, what is he supposed to think? How could they possibly expect to save the show at this point? Now they find Truman out on the ocean, sailing out to sea, but Kristoff still wants to stop him. So they cause a storm to get him to turn back, but Truman is still determined to make it. They go as far as hitting his boat with lightning and causing Truman to fall into the water. And Kristoff gives a line to show that he's willing to let Truman die. Chris, the whole world is watching. We can't let him die in front of a live audience. He was born in front of a live audience. Truman makes it back to the boat, and we get one of my favorite lines from the show. Is that the best you can do? You're gonna have to kill me! To me, this perfectly encapsulates Truman, his pure determination to escape his manufactured life and into the real one. Kristoff said earlier in the interview, we accept the reality we're given, but Truman hasn't done that. He's rejected the fictional reality and has a desperate need to escape it. He wasn't given the option to find the truth, he took it for himself. He didn't want to know the truth, he needed to. After he makes it to the exit, and before he leaves, Kristoff talks to him. He tells him that there's no more truth out there than in here, and that nothing bad can happen to him in the world he's created. Kristoff asks him to say something, and instead of giving some grandiose speech or anything like that, he just looks at him and gives him the canned line he's used over and over again. In case I don't see ya. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. This is because he understands what Kristoff wants, and he doesn't want to give it to him. He realizes that Kristoff would want some amazing grand finale to this show that's been on air for almost 30 years. So Truman basically gives him the biggest middle finger possible. After this, the movie ends on an entirely upbeat note, with Truman stepping out into the real world and all the people watching, cheering, and clapping. But this is a big part of what makes this movie truly great, because the best movies don't leave you ready to move on to something else. They'll make you sit and wonder just what the hell is going to happen next. Because while this movie seemingly has a happy ending, I think a good number of people realize it's not going to stay that way. This is simply a cleverly disguised tragedy. After realizing that everything Truman has known turned out to be a lie, how could he possibly trust anything ever again. This is what I was talking about earlier when it came to not being able to fully understand the ramifications of something like this. We have no baseline for what will happen to people that go through this, we can only imagine. And when you add on the fact that Truman is the most famous person in the world at this point, I feel he will never be able to discern reality from fabrication. If someone were to just hold the door open for him, he'd have to wonder why. Would it be because they're just polite, or would it be because he's Truman? Or were they told to do that by some scriptwriter? And that paranoia would seep into every facet 
facet of his life. His mother, father, wife, and best friend were all manufactured relationships. How would he get close to anyone without wondering whether or not they'd been fed lines from someone else? And now this is where I want to talk about Truman as a character. The very first lines we get from Truman is him pretending to be an adventurer, a nearly 30-year-old man still hanging on to his childhood fantasy of going out and exploring the world. This opening scene with Truman tells us so much of what we need to know about him, and it does so in a perfectly natural way. It's just a man getting ready for work, pretending to be a mountaineer in the mirror. But it's really so much more. It's his one real desire, to escape his normal life and explore the world. Just, it's just wonderful. But as the movie goes on, we start to see things be less whimsical, less cartoony. It starts to become darker. It begins with the flashbacks of his father drowning, then he actually sees his father, and his own mother lies to him. Then we get the flashbacks of Lauren and we see that he isn't truly happy in the marriage he has now. And to me, the awfulness of the situation truly sets in when his best friend is shown to be feeding him canned lines straight from Kristoff. This movie takes a person that I'm sure most people can relate to and feel empathy towards, puts him in a situation that could have been conceived by a Nazi psychologist, and it presses him just hard enough for cracks to start forming, but it never breaks him. Through all of it, he holds on to his desire to escape his cage and see the truth that comes with breaking out. Now I want to get back to the scene where Truman is sailing out to sea, because honestly I'll never truly be done talking about it. His search for knowledge has allowed him to conquer his fear of the ocean and achieve his goal of making it off the island. We know he has very strong suspicions that something is wrong with the island in his life, but he still doesn't know exactly what it is. This is another part of the movie where I feel like there was a real genius behind it. As Truman is sailing out to sea, we get this strong sense that he really hopes he's wrong about everything he suspects. That he'll just eventually reach land and be able to see the rest of the world. It's like when you suspect your significant other of cheating on you. You hope you're wrong, but you still need to know the truth. You won't be any better off from knowing the truth. In fact, it will likely make your life worse. At least temporarily. But what I'm saying is Truman won't be any better off from learning the truth either. In fact, his life is about to get much, much harder. But he needs to know. He needs to know if the suspicions he has about his entire life are true. And when he finally crashes into that wall, it's a one-to-one -one metaphor of him crashing into reality. His hope is that he's wrong about all of this, but him finding the truth is him literally hitting a wall. That's something that really resonates with me, and I feel like it would resonate with many people. And all this is made so much better by the fact that the script is so tightly written. I've thrown a couple minor criticisms at this movie, and I'm sure there are more. Like the fact that they have 5,000 cameras, and the night Truman escapes they have two people watching them. It's a little silly, but even then, they all thought that he had essentially gone back to normal. This happened after his wife had left him, so there must have been a good amount of time between his last escape attempt and this one, where nothing truly of note had happened. And I feel like, even without that excuse, this is such a minor flaw that it's barely worth mentioning. What I'm trying to say is, even when looked at objectively, this film holds up extremely well to scrutiny. That's why saying stuff like this... Every single movie will fall apart when you start picking it apart objectively. Seems so strange to me, because no, I don't believe every movie will fall apart when looked at objectively. It might be true that every movie has flaws when looked at objectively, but even then I couldn't be certain because I haven't critically analyzed every single movie in existence. However, a movie having objective flaws is not the same as it falling apart. That's a truly ridiculous statement and an insult to writers that actually take time with their scripts to ensure that they are internally sound and consistent as possible. Maybe it's true that no story will ever be perfect, but the effort to make it as close as possible should always be appreciated. Now, with all that out of the way, I'll say this. This movie is a bona fide masterpiece. The writing is absolutely top-notch. Dialogue never feels out of place or unnatural. I never noticed any editing mistakes. And the acting is phenomenal. Ed Harris is fantastic. Laura Lenny and Noah Emmerich do a stand-up job. But Jim Carrey, my god, the fact that he wasn't even nominated for an Oscar for this movie is a crime. He goes from a goofy, fun guy to a man wallowing in sadness over the death of his father to someone having a nervous break down and essentially holding his wife hostage, back to a goofy guy, and then to a man who's finally broken free of his proverbial chains, all without missing a single beat. I said before, I couldn't imagine this role being played by anyone else, and I really believe that Jim Carrey becomes Truman and it's magnificent to see. 
So if you've made it this far in the video and you haven't seen this movie yet, do it now. I promise you won't be disappointed. Even with everything mostly spoiled for you, it doesn't matter. This is a movie you could watch 10 times in a row and still find new stuff to appreciate and adore. I don't really like giving numbers to movies because it's really hard to stay consistent with them, but I know people appreciate them, so I would give this movie a 9 out of 10 easily. Everything is just so damn well done. So now I think I've said everything I wanted to say about this movie, so the review is over, and I just want to talk a little bit about what I hope to do with my channel. I really enjoy analyzing media, and I hope to be able to keep doing it, but I likely won't be able to keep doing that if I'm unable to grow an audience. So I want to say every time you guys like and subscribe, it helps me a lot. It really gives me a confidence boost that you all actually enjoy listening to what I'm saying. I'm going to start working a lot harder on getting these videos out a lot more regularly, the actual, you know, essay ones, but I'm also going to start uploading some commentary videos of my wife and I watching movies. Hopefully that'll be something for you to enjoy, but if not, there will be full-blown video essays interspersed between them, so feel free to skip the other ones. Uh, also, if you're more of a fan of the really long content, like my Mandalorian series, I promise more stuff like that will be coming in the future. This movie is just a lot different from The Mandalorian, as it obviously doesn't have the background and giant universe that Star Wars has, so... There was just, you know, a lot less for me to talk about. So, I guess that's really all I have to say for now. A big thank you for watching, and I'll catch you all later. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs>